Thank you for coming to share your Springfield story with us today. Take a minute, please, and introduce yourself and talk about your connection to the Springfield area. Okay. Um, I'm Mary Helen McDowell Porter. I was born and raised in Springfield on Boulevard. I was born in St. Luke's Hospital, the old St. Luke's. And we lived there on Boulevard until 1971, January of 71. My parents built their house in 1948-49. They borrowed the money from my grandfather. Um, they paid him back with interest and it was $10,000 to build the house. It was an original Sears and Roebuck plan. So that's when you can order your house plans from Sears. Yeah. All right. Let's let's back up just a little bit and, and okay. start with your grandparents. I know you said that they came to the Springfield area as well. Mm -hmm. My mother's mother was born in Quincy, Florida. So her family goes way back uh, several generations in Quincy, Florida. And my grandfather was from North Carolina. He had an older sister that lived in Densmore, so he came down when he was about 14 or 15, ran away, and came down and lived with her. Do you know about what year that was? Um, he was born in 1900. My grandmother was born in 1906. So I would say my grandmother was probably about 12 years old. Um, he was about 16. He worked on the farm in Dinsmore, and, and I guess her family lived close by. My great-grandfather was with the railroad um, in Quincy, Florida, so they moved here around the turn of the century. And um, I guess everybody moved here around the turn of the century after the fire. Was he still working with the railroad then? No, I think he had retired. Okay. He had retired by then. Um, so they met and my grandfather went to World War I, so they had to wait until he came back before they got married. So they got married in uh, 21. My father's mother was from Stark, Florida, and her father ran a uh, orange grove plantation. And once the oranges uh, froze in the, I think it was 1894 freeze, they decided to start growing strawberries. So he was one of the pioneer strawberry growers in Lottie and Stark. My grandmother used to shop in Jacksonville. So I would say they probably came up every once in a while to shop. And my grandfather had come down from North Carolina, or rather South Carolina, and he was a trolley car operator. And so we think that's probably how they met and they got married around 1912. Um, he then went on to be a police officer and he was originally a mounted police officer and his horse was an old circus horse. So whenever it heard music, it would start prancing. <laughs> so he led all the parades and he led the parade over the Acosta Bridge in 21. Was that when they opened the bridge? To the south side. Other than that, you had to catch a ferry to go across the south side of town. Um, also, with Arlington, you had to go by ferry, so we didn't have all these bridges back then. Um, my grandmother said that they could see the great fire from Stark. They could see the sky light up and the fire uh, because it was during the day. I guess it was very clear and they could see that, you know, there was a huge fire going on. I can't imagine the amount of smoke. Not to see it all the way from Stark, that would be incredible. So, talk about once your parents were back in the Springfield area, what was their life like then? Well, my parents were both born and raised in Springfield. My father grew up on 2nd Iona. My mother grew up on Market Street. Um, I think they lived in boarding houses, uh, a couple of different ones. I don't know that much about my mother's um, childhood other than what my aunts have told me. Um, so they went to school together, uh, Maddie B. Rutherford, and they went to Kirby and Jackson. My father went to Duval High School before Jackson. It was kind of a Votech kind of school, and my mother 
went to um, Jackson and then she graduated from Fletcher as one of the first classes because her family moved to the beach. Um, so my father's father went on to be a motorcycle policeman and then a detective in the 30s. So they stayed in Springfield. My mother's father became a night watchman and they lived at the beach so at night he would go around and tell people lights out because of the German U-boats off the coast during World War II. So my mother and father ran into each other after my father came home from World War II. He was on furlough because he was injured and they ran into each other and they started dating. They got married. Um, he used to walk across the Main Street Bridge to pick her up and go to the VFW and so they would you know, go out on dates. And then when they first got married, they moved in with my grandparents on 2nd Iona. And my grandfather owned the land on Boulevard, so he gave all three of his sons a piece of property. And so my uncle built his house, and then my parents built their house. And their younger brother decided he didn't want to do that, so he moved to the south side. So we grew up next to our cousins, however, they were older because they were born before the war and we were born after the war. So my father and his brother lived side by side all those years um, from the 40s all the way to the 60s. And then once your parents got married, that's when you went to the Brentwood area? That's where they built. Okay. Yeah, on okay. Boulevard. On Boulevard. Okay. So we all grew up going to elementary school at Brentwood elementary. We went to Brentwood Baptist. Um, my sisters and brothers all walked to school. They walked to Brentwood, Kirby, and Jackson. Um, I started getting bused in third and fourth grade to North Shore, and then in fifth and sixth grade I got bused to Long Branch Elementary, which was further away. And um, my mother didn't drive and she didn't work, so whereas she could walk me to school kindergarten in first and second grade then I started getting bust and I started getting a nervous stomach and they would have to call her and say you know Mary's you know upset stomach you know she'd have to come get me and walk all the way there so it wasn't very convenient for her. Talk about um, what life was like during the time you lived there on Boulevard. Well um, we didn't have air conditioning like everybody else so um we had uh fans we would just have a tall fan so we would put that in our bedroom um the three of us girls had one bedroom my brother was the oldest he had his own bedroom so um if it got really hot we would get up and go sleep in the living room which happened often in the summer we slept with the windows open um, we had a furnace in the central part of our house so when it was cold we would run and get in the furnace and stand on the furnace to warm up. Um, we had a good sized yard. Uh, we had swing sets, uh, trampoline, monkey bars, um, a sliding board, um, and then we had a garage with a, like a play area in there also. So we played in our backyard, but most every day we got up and ate breakfast and we went straight to Brentwood Park and we played there all day. We would go home for lunch and then we would go back and play until it was dinner time. Um, there was a building called Hobbyland, so in the summertime you could go and make crafts. So every day we were learning how to make uh, coin purses and sew them and you know make little um, moccasin shoes and things like that. And we'd go home and take them to our parents and show them what we did or pot holders. I probably made a million pot holders when I was a little girl. Um, I used to go to the projects, which was on the other side of the park, and that's where the um, housing development was for lower income families to help them get started on their feet and go forward. So there were um, ladies that would freeze Kool-Aid in a cup, and so you could go and knock on their door and give them a nickel and you would get a frozen cup of Kool-Aid. So we did that, and we had no idea who these people were, but that's what we did. Um, were there we also, a lot of kids? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I played, we would walk down the alley. We had an alley in our backyard, so we would walk down the alley. Um, I had a couple of friends that lived on 21st Street and 22nd Street. Um, 
everybody just were normal kids. We played, we played out in the street. We rode our bicycles, we roller skated on the octagon sidewalk with the metal skates and the little uh, skate key around your neck. Um, of course, you'd have to stop and, and tighten them up. Um, or we would skip and sing songs around the block. So we would do that. And I tell my mother, I'm going to go out skipping. So, you know, I was four and five years old and we just left the house. Um, so we, we had a normal childhood. Um, you know, our father came home at five o'clock, dinner was ready. So we knew, you know, I guess in the winter time, if it was getting dark, we knew, you know, it's time to go in when it was dark. Um, we trick or treated all over the north side. We would take the brown paper grocery bags. And at one point, my sister took me back home to get another bag because it was full of candy. And the only thing we had to fear was they would say, don't eat the cookies and don't eat the fruit. Because we started hearing there might be a razor blade in the fruit or something like that. So of course, we never ate the, the loose cookies or the fruit anyway because you know they were crumbled up in your candy. And you wanted the candy. <laughs> of course, and I would have enough candy to last me through Christmas. So, um, you know, Easter was a big deal. We would go um, back to school shopping um, and then we would go- Where did you go shopping? Gateway. Gateway. Everybody went to Gateway. Okay. Well, now before that, my mother, and her generation shopped downtown. So they had Lawn's department store, they had Joe Rose shoes, um, Ivy's, Furch gets May Cohen's were downstairs. May Cohen's had the elevator and they had an elevator operator. And so she would do the little lever which would take you up and down the elevator. Um, in the 60s, things started growing out. People started migrating outward from downtown and they started building the neighborhood malls so that you had stores to shop in each neighborhood. Um, Gateway grew and grew and grew. Regency Square grew and grew and grew, so they became huge. Um, my sisters would get up on Saturday and they would wash their hair and roll it and put a scarf on and they would walk to Gateway from our house and they would go to uh, Cloth World and they would buy patterns and then pick out their fabric and buy the fabric and they would come home and they would sew dresses. Then they would take their hair down and they would put their dresses on and go on dates. So that was an all day process to go on a date back then. Um, we grew up going to Brentwood Baptist. My father was a deacon and we were always at church for Sunday school, training union, Wednesday night prayer meetings. My mother was involved in the, the women's group. She was also the Girl Scout leader, so we had our Girl, Girl Scout meetings there. Uh, my father went to visitation, so my parents' social life revolved around the church. Um, my mother and I would go visit other ladies um, in the neighborhood. We would walk and visit them if they were elderly or shut in. So I would take my raggedy in and I would sit there and listen to them talk and visit. And um, so, you know, women back then would volunteer and do things like that. Um, I do remember they opened the 7-Eleven on 20th Street by the expressway, which is now Martin Luther King Boulevard. So we would get up and get a quarter and walk down and get penny candy and come back with a bag of candy and eat candy and have tea parties with our baby dolls. Um, we also played with Barbie dolls and paper dolls like there's no tomorrow. So you didn't sit home and watch TV? We didn't watch a lot of TV, uh, but we did have the one TV that had the stereo turntable in it. And our family watched everything together at night. Um, and the, we only had channel 12 and channel four. So that's what you watched. Uh, I don't remember watching PBS. I uh, don't think I'd ever heard of it. They didn't come out with Channel 17 until I was probably in junior high. And my father wasn't going to go out and buy a new TV just so we could have Channel 17. So I missed out on all those shows um, growing up. So didn't get to see the Brady Bunch, the Partridge Family until they were reruns. But our TV was also black and white. I never had a color TV until I was married. 
Never had air conditioning in my car until I was married. And we moved in 1971, no, January 72. We moved um, from Springfield to our lake house in Keystone Heights. Um, we added on the bedrooms and bathroom. We had an original cottage. And so that's when we had central air and heat in our house. And so for the first time, we had air conditioning as of 1972. What led your family to leave? Um, well, my mother used to walk to Banner Food Store, and we also walked to, um, she walked to Coors Beauty Salon, which was across from Starbucks. And that was like a five and dime store. Um, going to school one day, we noticed uh, a chalk outline outside of Mr. Starbucks store and um, someone had gone in to rob him and so he pulled out a shotgun and shot him dead. So that was a little scary. We started having more crime in the area. My mother was waiting for me to get off the bus um, in front of our grocery store and these guys jumped out and beat her up and stole her purse. Um, she had a nervous breakdown after that so that was the pivoting point where we were gonna move because she didn't feel safe anymore. So um, my father had been a mailman. He delivered mail all over the north side, Arlington, for since he got out of World War II. So he retired early at 55. Um, so he was driving back and forth a couple of years. I think he retired in probably 74, 73, 74. How did your life change from living downtown to living in <laughs> Keystone? In the country. Drastically, um, we were five miles down a clay road, so we were on a lake, um, but it's January, so it's too cold to go swimming, so there we sat staring at the lake. Um, you couldn't ride a bicycle down a clay road, you couldn't roller skate anywhere, um, you couldn't walk anywhere. Obviously, um, my friends and I would try to walk to each other's houses, which were miles away. Um, my sister was in her junior year, so she didn't get to graduate from Jackson. Um, but she would wake me up and say, we're not going to school today. It's raining. And the clay road, basically, back then they didn't grate them. So they had gully washers, gigantic holes, just basically ponds. So we had a little tiny car and there was no way she was gonna drive through that. And it seems like in the 70s, it rained every day. So we had portable buildings instead of being in one school. Um, each portable building had a huge pond outside of it. So you had to, you know, maneuver around from class to class. Um, and our school was kindergarten through 12th grade. So being in sixth grade, you saw little tiny kids and then you saw the seniors and there were separate bathrooms. There was the, the high school bathroom, the elementary bathroom, um, the kindergarten bathroom. Um, so it was a very different way of life. Um, okay. Very so, isolated. <laughs> isolated. And so you live in Riverside now, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about the historic neighborhoods, Riverside, Springfield, um, San Marco, mm -hmm. how, how have you seen changes in the historic districts? Well, I moved to Riverside because my sisters had moved back and they lived on the west side in the Riverside area. So I always loved the old historic homes which I love Springfield, and that was the closest thing safe um, for me. So I love the old historical buildings, the architecture. Um, I do interior design, so I love the interiors, the exteriors. Um, Springfield finally started coming back in 2000. Uh, we had SRG homes rebuilding. Uh, renovating homes, uh, building new homes to look like the old style. Um, Riverside has continued to grow. It's a very safe neighborhood to live in. Um, we have more restaurants, 
it used to be more shops, but now there's just more restaurants and it's growing and growing. San Marco, the growth has slowed down a lot. Um, I think it will start coming back and they'll have more restaurants and stores over there. Um, once the economy died, I did see Springfield and San Marco kind of die. Riverside kept growing. Um, so I do see both of them coming back. Um, and I was excited to be a part of the Symphony Show Houses. Talk, explain what a Symphony Show House is. The Symphony Guild partners with ASID designers, American Society of Interior Designers. So in conjunction, we had Symphony Show Houses every year and we would have to have a builder who was willing to build a house and have it on the market for at least a year while it was being built. We were deciding how we were gonna decorate each room. So each designer is appointed a room to decorate and then we would have meetings to coordinate color schemes. Um, in the beginning, they didn't match. So you would have like a child's bedroom next to a red and black bedroom and, and it, there was no flow. And then we started doing more, they had more flow. And fortunately, then it became a very beige world to where everything is same color, same color, same style. Um, but what we did in Springfield was SRG built four houses and they hired me as a designer to design each house completely different. So I had to pick the exterior paint, the doors, shingle colors, um, stacked stone, um, all exterior products, interior, tile, um, countertops, cabinets, lighting, plumbing. So I would go to the plumbing store and just pick something for each house. And so that's how I did that. I would look for tile, this house, that house, that house, that house. So. The first house on the corner is the traditional house. And this is on the corner of Silver and... Seventh? Mm, no, no, I think seventh, maybe closer seventh. to fourth that okay. down this way, because this is seventh right here. Okay, yeah, it's further towards Clutho Park. Right, right. Um, the, so the first one is traditional and it's more beige tones, more earthy tones. Um, the second one was contemporary so we had more high-tech glass tiles things like that um, a honed countertop instead of a polished granite um, we did more straight edges um, the third one was craftsman style which was more heavy textures slate stacked stone split based um, just more rustic uh, cabinets and molding and the fourth one was vintage Springfield so that was more the black and white marble the little black and white um, checker floor mm -hmm. tiles that we used to have the octagons um, we did the white marble in the kitchen with a farmhouse sink um, one of the bathrooms had a black marble countertop with a marble mosaic black and white and then we had the marble white floor in the middle so they were all very very different so then each designer got a room and they had to decorate around those styles now they can paint whatever color they want um, but then they'd have to repaint it so were they fundraisers for the symphony is that yes how that it, it was a huge fundraiser okay. um, the designers would get part of the money because we sold tickets also but that used to be the symphony's big money raiser. Um, we don't have those anymore once the economy died. You know, we didn't have builders that wanted to do that. And as a designer, you either borrow things or it comes out of your pocket. So if you're having drapes made, bedding, it comes out of your pocket. So you can write it off on your taxes, but it does become a huge money pit year after year. And we didn't always get work off of it, so right. sometimes you did, sometimes you didn't. So it was a gamble, but it got you into Water's Edge magazine, so they photographed us. Um, Florida 
uh, no, Jacksonville Magazine would photograph our rooms and us. So it was good exposure. Um, it got the name out there for Springfield and got more people moving here. And then, of course, the economy died shortly after that. So, okay. but I do see the economy coming back and I see Jacksonville growing. There's a lot more building and, and it's spreading out further now into Nocatee and St. John's and further north side and further west side. So things just keep spreading out. Um, there's a lot more commercial work going on, so it's definitely growing again. Okay. Is there anything that you'd like people to know about the Springfield area? Um, I think it is a hidden gem that people don't know about. Um, a lot of people that move here don't even know about Avondale. They've never heard of it. Um, but, you know, I don't like that the north side has gotten a bad name because it was a beautiful, lovely place to grow up and, and play and it was safe. Um, it was safe my grandparents' time, my parents' time, um, and, and in my you know, childhood, it was a very safe place to live. So I hope that more people will come over here and, and buy and redo houses and appreciate them and you know, not let them get torn down. And you know, it's good to see them coming back and appreciating because they don't build houses like this anymore. No, they don't. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you again for sharing your story. Thank you.